Representative O'Neill, thank you for joining us. Can you tell us a little bit about your professional life and your home life? So outside of the Capitol, I currently own a construction company. And people are always surprised when I'm a woman that's, that says that, but I'm in the trades. And I'm a part owner in a tile setting company. So when I'm not here, I'm doing accounting and taxes and government compliance and all that kind of stuff, which is why I find myself on things like the Unemployment Insurance Advisory Council, because I actually file that. <laughs> I'm one of the few legislators that actually have to file that kind of thing and um, workman's compensation and do payroll things and, and all of that. So I get to do all those fun things when I'm not here at the Capitol. And can you tell us a little bit about your, your personal life? Sure, so I have two children and my son is 21. He's married to a woman that is 21 and they have the same birth date, which is kind of fun. And uh, we, have a, we had a really, really busy year. It's been wonderful. He went through basic training, so he's in the military. Right after he got back, he got married. And then three months after that, around Christmas time, he called and he said, Mom, you're gonna be a grandma. <laughs> and so now I have a six month old grandbaby. She's six months old today, her name's Lydia. And she's just beautiful. She was born with a full head of black hair and just as, just as gorgeous. And then he's actually working for the company right now, trying to pay off some school debt. And then he'll go back to St. Cloud State and he'll be getting his degree in biotechnology, which is really an emerging field. It's so exciting. I was just at St. Cloud State a couple days ago and uh, they have a $44 million building that we just put up, the state did, you know, in the bonding project. And it's beautiful and it's a multifunctional lab space. I can't wait for him to go and really dig into his major there. And then my daughter, Olivia, is at the University of Minnesota. So I have one of the Minsk systems, soon to be, again, back. And then my daughter, Olivia, is at the U of M and she's in the Carlson School of Business. And I'm so excited, she's double majoring in um, French and international business. So I can't wait to see where she heads. Tell us about your district and what your constituents care about. I have a great district. You know, I was just talking to somebody the other day and they said, well, we're not quite Metro, we're not quite Greater Minnesota. So we have this bridge. We're kind of this bridge between the two. We have um, some very rural life and I have lots of farmers and lots of ag. I also have uh, two large cities and a smaller city. So Buffalo and Monticello are fairly good sized cities. And the, where I live in Maple Lake, it's small and it's cute and it's, it reminds me of the hometown I grew up in. Um, the people are incredibly friendly, they're hardworking, many of them commute. So I have a lot of bedroom community type folks. And uh, we also have a good number of them with good college degrees too. So I've, I've got the diverse. Um, a lot of them are in the trades too, interestingly enough. I have a lot of people that own their own little companies and they do, you know, uh, HVAC or electric, uh, they do, um, they're electricians or plumbers or uh, general contractors. We have all kinds of that in, uh, in Wright County too. What are your legislative priorities for the upcoming session? So I'm on several committees. I have five committees, which is a little bit more than most. Um, I'm the vice chair of higher education, and so I've been doing so much work in the education field. And in fact, I just uh, came from a meeting with the chancellor of Minsky System. And um, we're really taking a look at a cohesive look between um, really pre-K all the way to career. And so we're really trying, my goal is to break down the barriers between all of the educational systems, which is a really big task. Uh, the, yesterday I was at Wright Tech, which is, um, it's actually an alternative high school that's a co-op for all of Wright County. And so you can go there as a junior or a senior and you can learn all kinds of technical skills. And I'm telling you, business is at their door every single day and maybe they're going to be um, a beautician or um, an auto mechanic or a welder or in construction. There's a whole gamut of folks there and they are just in high demand. So my job, I feel, is to try to break down these silos and really look at how do we educate kids all the way from pre-K all the way to career. So I've been doing a lot of work in that and we'll be having some committee hearings kind of about that. Um, I'm excited about that work. In midst of doing all of that, I've also stumbled upon something else that's also important to my district and to the state of Minnesota. Over the summer, we began to see some videos that came out about what Planned Parenthood was doing and kind of where these uh, uh, aborted fetal tissues ended up. And I kept, I, I was in my district and I kept getting asked, does the University of Minnesota do aborted fetal tissue research? And so um, with my relationship with them and talked to them so much, I did ask them, you know, 
do you do that? And sadly, initially, the answer I got back was, no, we don't, which wasn't the correct answer. So that became sort of a, a big kind of scandalous type thing that happened over the summer. And we've been working through some of those issues and still not resolved. But it turns out they've actually been doing this research for about a decade, and they currently have seven or eight researchers that are doing research with aborted fetal tissue. And so that's something that's um, really at the heart of the life movement, and there are a lot of very strong pro-life people in my district. It's a very conservative district. And so they are really, really concerned about basically creating a market for the aborted fetal tissue. And we don't want to in any way encourage folks to have abortions. That really is something that's not desirable by society at all. And so to create a market where it goes and, you know, in some of the videos you see that they're paying very high prices for those things. And if you look at the invoices from the U, they were actually paying thousands of dollars for pieces of tissue that even on the video they were saying that they were selling for or I don't know, maybe donating, I don't know, donating, selling, whatever you want to say for maybe 50 or $60. So there's something happening there that just isn't above board. So we really need to dig into that issue a little bit. Um, there is a great question whether or not the University of Minnesota was actually in compliance with our state and federal laws. Um, I'm not sure that they were. I'm not a, a legal expert, but in the, the plain reading of the law, I would say that they were not. And they have taken steps to change how they do things. So that also has consumed a lot of my time. One, because it's a life issue. Two, because it's the University of Minnesota where my daughter goes. And, and I think we should have great pride in that school. Um, but three, we need to make sure that they're following the law. And so we've been working a lot with that too. I'm very excited about that. And then on the other side of it, um, I also am on the Jobs, Energy, and Economic Workforce Development Committee. And we've been talking about the clean power rules. And so, you know, um, the Supreme Court just overturned Obama's, uh, the Obama administration's clean power plan. And so, and now our governor has said he wants to move forward with it anyway. Uh, we're gonna be having a lot of those conversations in our committee. And since I do have the Monticello nuclear power plant within my district and the Sherco, which is the coal fire plant just outside, there's three facilities there within Sherco, it's one, two, and three. Um, that's a big concern to my district. A lot of jobs, a huge economic in impact upon my community and the community just outside of mine. So that will be another big issue and it relates right, you know, right back to my home district and, and actually to the state of Minnesota because they provide so much power. You know, we can't live without power and we don't want our rates to just go through the roof. So we really need to do this with thoughtful care and I've had a lot of conversations with Xcel Energy and you know, trying to balance everything of uh, aging infrastructure um, an aging population of people that are working. So we've got their workers are aging out. And really, how do we balance all of that? So those are just a few of the top issues. I've got a whole long list on my desk of things, but those are a few things that have consumed a lot of my time in the interim. Well, my final question is, who do you find inspirational and what do you find inspirational about him or her? So I, I find my brother and this is my brother, uh, Brian Daniels, who was just elected to the office. And I talk about him all the time, and he's probably embarrassed that I do. But he is so inspirational to me because he overcame so much. You know, he's physically disabled himself. Um, almost 20 years ago, he had a brain tumor. And at that time, they told him he didn't have a whole, a very long to live, but they were wrong, thankfully. <laughs> and they, they resected, and they did all this treatment. And the treatment was life-saving and wonderful, but it also partially paralyzed him. So you see him walk down the hallway and he's got this you know, heavy kind of limp, but it's because that leg is basically paralyzed and he has to think really hard with each step to be able to walk. And he's so incredibly inspirational because he's so humble, he's so kind to people, he's so generous with everyone. He's in pain all the time and he wears a smile and you would never know it. And he is so, I just, I'm just so thankful he's here because uh, we office right next to each other, and um, and I'm just really proud of him with what he's done and how he's gotten here and how genuine and kind and loving he is to everybody here. Representative O'Neill, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me.